So anyway, I'll hand over to Andy um, and um, thank you very much. Yeah, very good. And uh, with me is Rich Niles, uh, kind of my right-hand man up and down the East Coast doing this. And, and he is going to tweak me if I miss something important. And maybe when we get to the kind of the end of it about some of the implementation, I might ask him to uh, do something. Thank you all so much. I'm very honored that, that you would take your morning to do this. Um, I am going to talk really fast. Um, so take a deep breath. I figure if I cover more things uh, and tweak your thinking on it rather than go too deep in one thing, that will probably be more useful to you. So that's, that's my intention. Um, everybody knows what the, uh, what the hydrological cycle is, rainfall, runoff, evaporation, cloud formation. But there's another cycle around called the hydroillogical cycle. And the hydroillogical cycle looks like this. Flooding, panic, planning, procrastination. And uh, I remember in my hometown that uh, I probably went around uh, the hydroillogical cycle five times on Mill Creek over 25 years. And uh, we could never break out of that hydroillogical cycle. And it's not just flooding, but there's a whole host of drivers or reasons and these are kind of the top ones, drivers or reasons that um, uh, cause us to, uh, let me see if I can close this little window that's blocking my view, um, that, that in aggregate begin to kick off this idea that I'm smart enough to solve these problems, but when I look at why these exist and I kind of work my way down to, to basic reasons, what I always hit that there's not enough money to solve the problems. And when I ask myself, why isn't there enough money? I always go down to because uh, I, as a stormwater expert, have failed um, to find ways to build support for stable, adequate funding for stormwater, and I've failed to be able to create vision for stormwater. And so um, the only way to break out of that cycle, of course, is through dollars. Well, it's not quite that easy or anyone could do it. So somewhere in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, a few ideas began to gain traction um, with public works leaders in the U.S. And we could really summarize those as stormwater. You've got two older siblings, water and wastewater. And uh, wastewater is a Harvard physician. And uh, water supply is a Johns Hopkins uh, economist. And you are still living in mom's basement and it's time you, you know, got a job, got married, grew up. So how do we grow you up? That was the question. And the first big idea that came along was we have a water system, we have a wastewater system, and we have a stormwater system. And in each one of those systems, there is something a typical property owner would say, that's mine. And, and if that breaks, I'll take care of it. But they would say, this isn't mine. This is yours. This is a public system. And you should take care of that public system. I shouldn't need to. Uh, water and wastewater are not parcel based. If that uh, wastewater main um, at the back uh, broke and, and wastewater came percolating up and that homeowner called and said, uh, there's wastewater percolating up in my backyard, the wastewater operator would never say, sorry, it's not on the right of way. Uh, we, we don't handle it because they don't think that way. They, they have a system-based thinking. And so when we think about stormwater, we think about stormwater not in a parcel basis, not even in a right-of-way basis, but we think of it as a, as a completely connected system. And I own or operate that system. It starts from the very first time public water enters the stormwater system until it leaves my jurisdiction. And then I begin to transform my program to be able to operate that system within legal and financial and political boundaries. And the way that I control uh, that definition from running away from me is I, I have an extent of service policy that says, where do I go? I have a type of service policy that says, what do I do when I get there? And I have a level of service policy that says, how well do I do it? I actually have a, um, 
AOS, an ability of service policy as well, which is what will it take uh, for me to be able to operate in various parts of the system? Do I need um, an easement? Do I need ownership? Do I need written permission one time and so on? But the first big step that people took was, I need to think, think in terms of system and I, I cannot let right of way Special skills. Be, the, be the limit uh, to my stormwater system. So here from Lawrence Arbach is a three different descriptions of how green infrastructure is now beginning to influence the idea of right of way. And that right of way is not a boundary, it's just a line on the ground that defines some ownership, defines some operation. But uh, as we think of WISUD uh, down in your neck of the woods, green infrastructure up here, we begin to understand that stormwater is an attractive resource and the right of way can be shared. Um, I know the city of Atlanta, for example, did some very hard work at how to share rights of way so that people like hotel owners, their property could literally spill right out to the edge of the street. And the right of way was a shared green infrastructure project that both street water and hotel water ran to. And the hotel agreed to maintain it on behalf of, of the joint owners, that is the city and the hotel. Makes sense because a third of the runoff and by far more of the pollution comes from roadways. So stormwater is a system like water and waste. Second one is it should be run like a business. It should be a comprehensive business-like approach. Um, just like water and wastewater is most of our leaders, our business people, or many of them are. And when I take a business-like approach, then I get far more traction with local council and, and so on. So when we think about the business of stormwater, we think about what we do in stormwater. Here is a typical pie chart in the U.S. for what things cost money, how much money they cost. You can see the big, the big three are capital construction, operations, maintenance, environmental compliance, development regs, and engineering and planning tend to be in there, and then other things add in. And so I think, okay, this is my business. These are the products, and the citizens are my customers, and I need to treat them like customers. When I think about what it takes to fund this business, um, this is some, some data uh, Rich and I and others developed over the years, but we describe our stormwater program, and this is dollars per developed acre per year. I know you guys use acres and hectares. I'm also not sure exactly how U.S. translates. I know your, your Australian dollar is 75 U.S. cents, but I don't know if your costs translate the same way. So I'll kind of keep it in somewhat U.S. terms as we go. But you can see that if I'm if I'm down around $50 an acre, I kind of have an incidental stormwater program in the US. And to have a, a pretty good stormwater program, I'm up around $200, $250 an acre per year to run a program like that. So the last of the three key ideas, the big three is, so it's a system, I'm gonna run it in a business-like manner. And to be effective, I need business-like revenue coming in, so we call it safe revenue. And what do I mean by that? I know of at least 200 funding methods or, or resourcing methods to uh, help stormwater programs. And they fall into four buckets. One is I, I, can, I can just be way more efficient using technology and, and efficient operating systems and privatization and so on. I can gain 10% with efficiency. Resources, I can use other people to do some of my program, whether they're nonprofits or donations of land, donations of, of cleanup, things like that. That can help me a bit, free stuff from the web, free stuff from my neighbors. Money is one time limited. It's like a, uh, an inheritance. It's like getting a refund on your taxes uh, and so on. But I can't live on money. I live on revenue, and revenue is regular, predictable, budgeted flow of financial resources, and we need revenue to live on. So when I look at the kinds of things that might make up a stormwater program, and here's, here's kind of a, a fairly exhaustive list of the big eight. Um, when I look at a list like this and I ask myself, how much of this can I cover with something other than revenue? 
and and there are bits and pieces that you can cover and you go oh we got a grant so we can do this and and oh we we got this we can do this and and whatever but at the end of the day you need a paycheck to live stormwater wise and so we're we're saying what is a paycheck well a stormwater utility or a stormwater user fee is first of all a paycheck it's revenue it is sufficient, adequate revenue that comes in year in, year in, year out. And so, and so it allows you to do lots of things in terms of planning, cost share, looking for grants, making promises to people about when you'll fix something, partnering. Revenue opens up all sorts of doors for you to hire the right people, to get the right program going. When we say you're going to set up a stormwater utility, what do we really mean by that? And I had a big argument today with a city council about this very, very question. Um, first of all, it is just a way to get money. What's a stormwater utility? It is a funding method. We could call it something else instead of the, the U word. We could say the stormwater service or something. It is just a way to get money. But if you're charging somebody a line item on a bill that they thought they were getting for free or for taxes, you'd better offer better service than you offered before. So secondly, it's a program concept. The utility does this, call the utility for that. Uh, I saw the utility working in the street the other day. So it's a program concept. And finally, it's an, it, it can be, but doesn't have to be an organizational entity. It could simply just be uh, one part of, of your public services department or one part of the planning or whatever. Or it could be a standalone entity, it could be a sub-department, but there has to be somebody where, where the Australian dollar stops there. You know, the, the person who says, um, if you get to my office, I'm the one responsible for solving your problem, so you've come to the right place. And, and there has to be some focal point. If stormwater is scattered across four departments, and it's always kind of the, 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 the kid sister in every uh, meeting, then it will never be successful. At some point in some place, it has to have its own identity. Okay, um, why a stormwater utility fee approach um, to revenue? Why, what makes it better than other things? This is part of your argument that you, you're using uh, to set this up. And uh, I say there are four big things that make it better than taxes, better than some other approach. Um, and SAFE just is a great acronym. Um, first of all, it's stable. Here is what your tax-based or money-based stormwater program budget looks like. Um, you probably have an annual budget that's a certain number. And then if something bad happens, then I'll get some money from the local council to fix that bad thing. Or I may wait years to fix that bad thing. But I'm operating in the trough. I'm operating on the dotted line. And I have to fight for that line to go up. And so I really can never have a program that's successful because I'm always operating below optimum with money. And then I get a, a, a flush of money to fix something. Then I have to try to staff up or hire up to fix it. So I'm not very efficient at fixing it. And I fix one thing and there's another hundred things that need fixing. So it's a, it's a very, very frustrating, some of you are probably nodding up, it's a very, very frustrating existence. Whereas when I have a fee, or a dedicated tax-based funding, not just tax, but dedicated. It, but it, let's take a fee. If I have a user fee, two things happen. One is I have stable, adequate revenue for life. The, the money um, is there. It's there week in, week out. I can do a 10-year capital program and execute that program. I can promise uh, Jillian when I will come and fix her flooding problem and uh, meet that promise. I can pledge this money to get federal dollars and matching grants and things um, because the money will be there. Secondly, you notice the line goes up and to the right. Every time somebody builds, my budget goes up. I'm not stuck with a certain tax base budget that's flat while the, the demands rise. My budget goes up automatically as my community grows. And that's a good thing, especially, <laughs> especially in a community that's, uh, that's growing fast. Um, getting behind in that sort of a setting is a, is a pretty typical thing. Um, typical monthly fees around the U.S., uh, and this is a couple years old now, uh, I saw an average now of 482 uh, from 2018. But this is, the, this is the average for the median-sized house per month U.S. dollars. 
So if you add 25% to this number, that would make it kind of an Australian equivalent, I think. Um, some you can see are 50 cents, which you just wonder what they were thinking. Um, and I just came from Portland. There's a, a the, the, the right-hand edge of this chart is Portland, Oregon, up at $26 now this year. Um, but the average is around 4 or $5. In other words, that is, it's not $30 a month. It, it's not, it's something that is pretty affordable. It, it tends to be below people's scream level. It's just a nice latte, uh, a good dark beer. That's really kind of all it is a month. And so it's pretty doable. The interesting thing is that for every $1, when I go back to that chart of what a program looks like, for $1, I get about 25 US dollars. For a $1 fee, I get about $25 per acre. And so for a $6 fee, I'm right in the middle of a moderate program that can handle most things in my stormwater program. So a $6 per equivalent residential unit. So if you're a business that's five times as big as a house in terms of impervious area, you'd get a five to $30 a month fee. Um, utility can in U.S. can typically generate around $25 to $40 per developed acre per year for every $1 you charge. So you can kind of use those as rules of thumb, which I did for these uh, eight or nine areas. And I took the whole metro area because it was easier to do than to figure out. But uh, so let's take, uh, let's take Perth, for, for example. Um, a $1 fee generates $25 million Australian dollars. Uh, $3 fee, 77 million. And that's, that's big money. Uh, now these are big, you know, two and $3 million dollar, uh, million person communities in, in the whole metro area. But you can see that for a, a, a charge that is not onerous, is not uh, a crippling, um, you can generate a lot of revenue from something like that. And that's what made you, uh, stormwater utilities so popular in the U.S. is people said, People will support this if I can make a compelling case, and I'll have enough money to do what I need. No two are the same, flexible, SAF flexible. You can fit these into any local or financial structure. I've set them up, like I said, Cleveland was 61 cities, three counties, um, run by a, uh, by a water and wastewater uh, district. I've set them up in communities of 10,000 people. Um, Rich, you've set some up up there kind of what's the average size up in new england that that you've set them up in uh pro probably uh 15 to twenty five thousand, some some less yeah so kind of local council size for some of the smaller local councils and yet uh they're doing the job for them right up there in new england yeah certainly certainly it's a big improvement yeah so um so no two are the same. So when you look at your situation, a stormwater user fee can be customized for you. We've set up special districts. We've gotten three governments to go together. Charlotte, Mecklenburg County, and all the cities around uh, went in in a, in a very kind of imaginative way um, and, and so on. So when you think about, well, I'm not a city or this wouldn't work for me or I'm too small, um, get some friends and do it. You know, have a party, have a stormwater party. Um, Equitable, how is it calculated? Uh, we say the more you pave, the more you pay. Water and wastewater, I'm sorry, water and wastewater. Uh, somebody's breathing hard in a mic and ought to mute their mic, sorry. Um, water and wastewater systems are based on use of the system. Now there, there's a water meter, wastewater uh, doesn't have a meter, but the water meter suffices. Use of the stormwater system is defined by one of two definitions, either total water off your system or increase in discharge from your system above some, some base level, let's say grass or forest. And peak flow, volume, and pollution are all linearly related or near linearly related to the amount of impervious area you have. So saying the more you pave, the more you pay is an is a easy way to explain it to people. When we say, uh, what is your billing unit? You can bill per thousand, you can bill per hundred, you can bill per anything. What people tend to understand is what is a house gonna pay? 
Uh, typically, it might be a couple hundred square meters, and that's not the that's not the the living space in the house. It's the impervious area. As you look down, if you're a raindrop falling, do I hit pavement or rooftop or grass? And then uh, non-residential properties pay on the basis of how many times that they are. So you might say this is one ERU and that's 40 ERU, so it pays 40 times, and we're gonna talk about credits in a minute, but it, it pays less. So as you explain it, this becomes um, a pretty simple way for people to understand our rate structures can get a lot more complicated, and I'm gonna talk about that in, uh, in just a few minutes here. But basically, um, that's kind of how it works, and so everybody gets a bill, it can be a monthly bill, it can be an annual bill, so the end result of this process in, in the beginning in the early 80s was a growing groundswell of change, starting with people saying, I have problems, I can solve the problems, it's gonna cost more, how will I pay for it? A user fee is the best way. And somewhere, there's somewhere around 2,800 or so stormwater utilities in the US now. In fact, it's becoming um, uncommon for communities of any size not to be funding their program with the stormwater utility in many places around the US. It, it's, it, it was interesting, it was like a, a good infection, I'll say, in, in that uh, the, one of the first ones was up in uh, Washington State, Bellevue, Hector Sears set that one up. And within 10 years, there were 20 of them up and down the coast. And I said, Hector, how'd that happen? He said, I'd speak at a conference on stormwater I'd tell them we're solving problems. They'd ask how. I'd tell them about a utility. Next morning, I'd get a call. Can I come see you? And, and off they went. Same in Florida. In fact, Florida passed statewide legislation um, encouraging utilities and giving financial aid and setting them up. And they just exploded in Florida because uh, uh, Florida realized that, you know, but for $50,000, a lot more communities could set up utilities let's come up with a zero interest loan to give it to them and they'll pay us back out of the utility revenue the next year, it, easy peasy. And so things just began to explode. Okay, how do I get started? Let's, let's pretend I'm interested in, in how now would I get started? Um, first of all, a little tip, um, you never go and say I'm out of money and I, I need more money. Uh, uh, the people you go to will say, so am I, so nice try. What we really start with is to focus on solving problems. What are the problems? And then the fee and the discussion of the fee comes in near the end of the study. It's not a foregone conclusion. It comes in near the end. And when it comes in, we ask for permission to begin the process of establishing the fee. We don't ask permission to establish the fee. And that is a world of difference in the human psyche. Because the city council can say, or, or local council can say, you're asking me if you can keep the process going. Sure. And so you come back and you say, here's what I think the program's going to solve. Here's the public input. Can I keep going? And they say, sure. By the time you get to the, uh, can we pass an ordinance to get this started, it's a it's a more of a baby step than a big leap off the high dive, and we found that approach to do very well. Um, I love this quote from Machiavelli. I set up the first stormwater utility in six different states in the U.S., and and I had this memorized. Uh, nothing more difficult than uh, um, trying to attempt to introduce a new order of things in any state, because uh, you have enemies, all those who derived advantage from the old order of things. And I'm not going to say who those enemies are, but you look around Australia and you go, who, who seems to obfuscate, complicate, and stand in the way of this? And those who expect to be benefit from it are but lukewarm defenders. That is, they want you to move out and draw fire. And so it's really, really, really important for us when we think about this to think about how we can do it the right way and how we can do it together the right way. Because of the first couple go, uh, it'll go if we have a couple failures right off, there'll be trouble. First, um, we have to know why we're doing this. And the, the why reason has to be both emotionally, that is right brain, and logical left brain compelling. And not just to me, but to uh, homeowners and businesswomen 
and sports people and even high school kids. It has to feel compelling. Here's a little trick that I learned years ago. It's called the Harvard Change Model. And that is your success in bringing about change is equal to D times B times P. D is how well can you make a compelling case? How well can you describe the level of dissatisfaction or desperation with the status quo? Pictures, statistics, testimonials. V, how attractive can you make the vision the way it could be, the way it should be, if we were able to get funding? How, can you describe parks? Can you describe solve flooding? Can you describe safe streets during a rainstorm? And so on. And P, how logical is your step-by-step -step plan to get from D to V? If you can say, we're very dissatisfied, we have a great vision, and here's how we can get there. All I need is a little bit of help from you. The odds of success get multiplied just like these get multiplied, the Harvard change model. So here is a typical logic uh, that we use. The problems are real, growing, and unresolved. This is where you, you make your case with the pictures and the statistics and the testimonies and, and so on. Real, growing, unresolved. Those three uh, adjectives are really important. They're, they're not pretend problems, they're not theoretical problems, they're real. They're not getting better, they're getting worse, and we haven't solved them. That, that leaves people very much hanging. We can resolve them, and we have a good plan. So now we've got D, we have V and P going there. Government must lead, individual citizens cannot solve it. And for your sake, I should say local government must lead. I know in Australia, there, there tends to be more of an administrative monarchy that kind of goes on where there's study after study after study, but at some point you have to move forward. Um, we, can't, we can't keep studying it and doing economic evaluations of it. We already know they work and we already know they do a good job. There, there are thousands of examples. We should get one up and running and see what will happen. It will cost more than we're spending now, but there will be visible benefits and it will be worth it. That means that we have to set up a utility to solve real problems on the ground that people can see. If you set up a utility to do master plans, you will lose. If you set up a utility to regulate people, you will lose. But if you set up a utility to solve problems and create beautiful uh, stormwater vistas, beautiful stormwater parks, beautiful stormwater treatment downtown, then people will rally around it. Among the viable options, that is, I'm not just stuck on a fee. You can't just say, we need a fee, we need a fee. But say, among the viable options, we've looked at them all. A user fee is the best and the most equitable to be the cornerstone of the funding. We can, we can add a lot of different fees and things, but it's going to be the cornerstone. If we ignore the problem, see you next year. See you after the next flood. I remember uh, coming to one council three times, and the third time they said, uh, we have your notes from last time. Can we just vote? <laughs> and everybody laughed. And I said, I warned you. I mean, if we, you know, if nothing changes, nothing changes. Um, and we have to change it. Um, first, I want to be very clear about some, some very, very key pitfalls. Most of the minds I stepped on early in my career. Um, first of all, who will not like this concept? Uh, tax exempt properties don't pay stormwater costs because they're paid out of taxes. They pay fees. Uh, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, and everyone pays. People with large paved areas but cheap buildings, parking lots, big warehouses that maybe have fallen into some disrepair, they'll have a big, a big bill. People on fixed income, uh, sometimes developers don't like it until developers realize they don't pay it. Owners pay the fee, not developers. And what developers get is better service from the local government because the local government is better funded. Uh, then we find developers are actually very much for the user fee as long as it doesn't bring in all sorts of complications to their lives. In the U.S., there, this has gone to state Supreme Courts uh, 28 times, uh, several <laughs> in Florida three times. Um, and there has been a body of case law that has been developed. First of all, the fee, the utility setup has to be fair and reasonable. And that's a little squishy, but there's sort of boundaries around that. 
it can't be illegally discriminatory or confiscatory. And by that, I mean, um, certainly the fee is discriminatory. Uh, large parking lots pay more than small parking lots, but it can't be illegally discriminatory. That, that is, you can't arbitrarily have one group, one neighborhood, one type of person pay more than another for reasons that have nothing to do with their use of the stormwater system or services. Confiscatory means my rules are so harsh that people are left with no alternate use of their property because uh, I have basically committed a taking from them. Um, the costs of the utility have to be related to the provision of facilities and services. You can't go build a stadium with this money. Uh, Nashville tried and the stadium got flooded the next year. I think it was God's retribution, the biggest uh, detention pond in town, flooded up to row 18. Um, we all kind of laughed, but anyway, um, so, so there has to be, uh, as a Johns Hopkins professor said, a monotonically increasing relationship between costs and fees. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect mathematics. It just has to trend in the right direction. And the rate has to be loosely based on demand. There, there is no meter, but imperviousness, impervious area has been tested in court five or six times, is one every time. It has to be legal. Um, several of us have looked at different parts of Australia. I know it's legal in Brisbane. I think it's pretty legal in Melbourne. Um, I'm not sure we looked other places, uh, but I think it's legal across, uh, across. maybe some little tweaks in there. You have to follow proper procedures. If it says you need a public meeting, you need a public meeting and so on. And then you must provide an opt-out provision in the U.S. or it looks like a tax. You, don't, you can't get out of paying taxes, but you can get out of paying a water bill by using less water by using water conservation fixtures. And so there has to be a way to reduce, and it's opt out has quotes around it, it doesn't mean out, it means down. There has to be a way of, of reducing your fee through credits. You can't just charge it. Uh, in the US, actually that number's now 27% were challenged in courts. You're gonna bill somebody enough money to make it worth their while because they've got an attorney on staff to challenge it, especially the new ones new utilities. So with that, it's a question of due diligence. And due diligence takes place in five key areas. So, and we're going to come back to this, but when I set up utility, it's really important that I understand what the governance of it will be, and particularly the intermunicipal governance and consensus about the utility. I need to understand the role of higher levels of government and I need to understand that it is a local responsibility to execute a local stormwater program. And other levels of government can do pieces of it, but they can't do all of it. It never works well when that is tried. Uh, the program concept has to be compelling and it has to solve real problems. It has to be right-sized. Public and political education support. Financial policies have to be pretty flawless, just like water and wastewater rate studies. And then database development uh, is, is somewhat important for legal due diligence, but it's really important for customer satisfaction due diligence. Um, if you are sending people the wrong bill and when they call someone who doesn't know what they're doing answers the phone, you will catch eight ways of hell for doing something like that. Here are justifications. Uh, for stormwater utility, that compelling case that don't work. Each of these has tried and the utility has failed. The government is making us do it. Um, Rich, was that somebody up in New England who said that it was the, the stormwater permit that was requiring this? Do you remember? Yeah, that's actually, um, that's, the, that's in many cases the leading message which we we try to spin around and focus on, on, on real needs. Um, it's, it's part of the equation, but um, it has been is emphasized quite a bit just due to the increased yeah. regulations in this, in this area. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and then you find out that's not really true. Someone, someone will blow the whistle. Everybody else has one. We call it utility envy. Um, and, and again, that is not a bad argument because council will always ask, well, who's doing this? Well, who's done this? Um, but Saying we're doing it because others have is a bad move. We can be first. Um, th that might be great. There might be some cities who want to do that. Uh, I worked with several of them. 
who wanted to be the first in the state and uh, bless their hearts, as we say in the South, um, they moved out and they drew fire and, and some of them succeeded, Bellevue, Washington, Boulder, Colorado. Um, I kind of bow to those people, uh, Kansas City, Kansas, Tulsa, Louisville. Uh, they were the ones who really broke ground for the US over the years. The general fund will get a windfall. Now the general fund may get a windfall, it may not get a windfall, but you kind of say that under your breath. We call it the peace dividend. Don't forget the peace dividend. You know, if we pay for stormwater uh, out of a fee, then the money we had been spending in stormwater might be available for some other use, not not a wink wink. But that's that's not a that's not a major thing. We're out of money. Um, welcome to local government. A lot of people will say that. Uh, I think uh, every one of these might be part of it, but the issue is my compelling case. I'm doing this because. We have a, a, a local responsibility under health and welfare or the police powers of local government to protect our citizens. And part of that protection is effective stormwater infrastructure that keeps water from people and people from water. And uh, we're not doing our job. Um, so the question is then there's lots of drivers for action, but are they compelling drivers? Um, I have been in meetings where you get a, a geeky engineer who's running stormwater and he starts talking about geeky things. Well, you know, our FEMA mapping could, could go to level four and our CS rating could be, and you just go, no, stop. No, no, no. People don't care about that. And so it has to be things that uh, people like and compare um, left brain, right brain. Here are, here are our standard things that we use to build a compelling case left brain. Uh, a, a, a map covered with um, measle dots. Isn't that what we did out on, the, out on the island, Cape Cod someplace? Or where did we do it, Rich? you remember where we did that measle map? Yeah, that was a uh, workshop we did in uh, Cape Cod. Ah, Cape Cod, yep, yep, yep. If you can work in Cape Cod, you should. Um, <laughs> or, or almost live there, I know, don't say anything. Um, uh, cost information, infrastructure information, backlog information, lost revenue or tourist dollars, and so on. Right brain, um, in uh, a place in Colorado, we had the secret weapon, and that was um, a, a mom who had three small children. She actually was an attorney and was working from home and raising her kids, and she had a video, and in that video, her children were screaming in the background as floodwaters took out her patio furniture and her privacy fence and washed them away. And she just stood up and like a prosecuting attorney, just kind of laid this out, put it to them. Is this what you're providing me for flood service? Is this the service you are providing me? <laughs> the mayor said, this should never happen in our community. And we were kind of doing like high fives under the table. And we thought, how could we get Jill Ledesma to change her name and come with us to every community? Because <laughs> she and that video were unstoppable in front of a, in a public meeting. But anyway, these are the kinds of things um, that you can use. So here's just a couple examples. Here's one. Yes, this is sewage. Yes, it's going into a freshwater creek. Yes, there's an elementary school uh, about uh, 200 feet downstream. Um, and the playground is right next to this little creek. And... Uh, this just disgusted a city council. They just said, really? And I said, this is one of about 600 like this in your community. And that was a start. Here's one. Uh, we have 2,500 stormwater complaints a year. 250 need engineering. We resolve 100 every year. 2,250 go to maintenance. We are able to resolve 900 every year. 60% of all our complaints go into our backlog, which is now 2,800 drainage complaints. And you just go, huh, okay then. No, not 20, it's more than 10,000, 11, 10,000 to something, is Charlotte, 10,200, something like that, drainage complaints. And it's like, okay, okay, I get it, I get it. Um, here's another one, houses in the floodplain. This is Fulton County um, outside of Atlanta. These are the houses that get flooded repeatedly. What should we do about it? And you just kind of, you, you look at a map like that and you're a little bit shocked. Here is one, this was Nashville, Wimpole Drive, May of 1979. Um, were we surprised by that? No, this is our flood map of Wimpole Drive, modeled in 1975. I did the modeling. 
uh, we weren't surprised at all. We knew this was going to happen, and we did nothing about it. We didn't warn the people. We didn't sell flood insurance to the people. We let them flood. Now, all these houses are now gone and bought out with stormwater utility fees. But, uh, but this is pretty telling. This was kind of a head hanger. Um, here's another one. Uh, this is Barry Berkowitz. He, he came. He brought these pictures. And he, he said, look, I'm a, I'm a stream engineer. And this is my backyard stream. And he just took us on a tour of it. And it was horrible. I mean, there were fences hanging. And, and uh, they were about to, to lose this uh, water supply pipe because it was just being under, undermined and so on. And people were like, huh, we don't get out there. Here's one. We have real and unresolved problems. And then we just press the button and uh, newspaper headlines from the last year just kept popping up. And uh, you just saw council people starting to nod almost in time with them. And I said, look, these are our headlines, you know, I hate clippings like this. We got a whole notebook full of them. Let's do something about it. Um, here's one. Nashville now spends 69 million annually, uh, depending on bonding on stormwater. Let's put that in perspective. Now, this is a, um, what do other people do? So the big three cities that Nashville likes to compare themselves to, Charlotte, Chattanooga, and Louisville, uh, double or better on stormwater. And they just kind of looked at that and they said, I get it. I get it. Yep, we're underspending. Um, so don't forget the taxation peace dividend as, as a reason, again, behind the scenes. Okay, let's shift gears very quickly to the mechanics of setting one up. And um, this is a, a two or three step process. Um, and I, we'll talk about each of these in just a minute. Um, and you can do uh, the second two with or without a SWAC, Stormwater Action Committee, SWAT, Stormwater Action Team, SWIL, Stormwater Integration Librarians, I don't know, but you come up with some name, and you can do it with or without a citizens group taking you through the process. Uh, sometimes it's a great idea, sometimes it isn't. So let's talk about this DIMS. Now, DIMS sounds like a very high-tech word. DIMS stands for Does It Make Sense? And uh, we finally realized that we could go to a city and have an informal discussion but it was way more effective if we took a half day and had a half day meeting with them. So it's maybe eight to 12,000 ish um, US dollars, a, a bit of fact finding ahead of time so that uh, we don't, uh, questions aren't asked that there isn't data sitting there for. A half day meeting internal with key decision makers, five or six people in the room, they get to pick who should be in the room. And we walk through a logic roadmap, which I'll show you in a minute, and we walk toward that, toward an evidence-based conclusion. And we hope that this statement becomes true at the end. But if it's not, like up in, uh, uh, up in uh, Vermont, Burlington, Vermont, said um, there is sufficient evidence to go ahead. However, we just raised our wastewater rate last year. We need to wait a year. And they waited a year, and then they went ahead. So it, it, the DIMS did its job, and the answer was delay for a year. But we hope it's like this. We think there is sufficient evidence to begin a well-defined and phased process of development of a stormwater user fee to support our local needs for the following reasons. Boom, 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 boom. And then we ask for permission to keep going. So this is, uh, this is what um, um, a DIMS study looks like. Those are the steps in it. Rich, do you want to relate anything about one of the ones that you've done? <coughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is um, quite often where people struggle with, we don't want to invest too much money to look at something that we may never move forward with, but we want to understand enough about the, the um, process for implementing utility, what it would do for us, how it would solve problems. So it's, it's, a, um, it's a nice way to kind of dip your toe in the water and, um, and explore it and then it's it's okay if the decision is not to pursue it, but what we always say is is the measure of success is whether you fund the program, whether you implement a utility or not, isn't necessarily the goal, but quite often is the natural conclusion. And then the next step is is more of a political challenge and education process um, where you dive deeper. Yeah, and and uh, the showstoppers is a great one because the people in the room know why this shouldn't go forward. 
and uh, you ask them, why do you think this shouldn't go forward? And, and they say, oh, did you know about, or, you know, this company is blah, 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 or city council is planning to do X, Y, Z next year. This, this wouldn't compete against that and so on. So it's, it's great to have those people in the room. The, if, if you decide to not do a DIMS and go straight to a feasibility study, or you decide after the DIMS, the next step is to involve citizens and, and let, the, let the ripples in the pond go out a little bit further. Then the feasibility study takes a group of, of citizens primarily and staff typically sit around the edge of the room and provide input and help. Um, but the, it, this, is, this is the citizens, uh, uh, they're on stage now. And you walk through all the key aspects of utility development without committing to utility development until everybody agrees it's a go. So <clears throat> what we typically go is go to council and say, oh, exalted ones, uh, you know, we're facing blah, blah, blah. You make your compelling case and you say, would it be possible if you appointed a group of 12 to 15 individuals, I have some ideas if you'd like to hear them, and we would like to walk with that group to find answers to the following questions. What are the significant problems, needs, and issues are, do we face in stormwater today? How have other people solved them? How should we solve them? What will it cost and how should we pay for it? Now, no council is gonna say no to that. I mean, they might, but no council is gonna say no to that because they're getting more fingerprints on the knife of the murder weapon, okay? If you get 12 to 15 citizens from all walks of life, and so there'd be a big business, small business, nonprofit, environmentalist, couple of flooded people, uh, a city leader, um, if you have a, one particular business that's big, maybe a couple of development community people and so on, you end up with 12 to 15. And that's a perfect a size. Uh, there's always two or three who can't make it. And if it were five, that would leave two. Um, if it were 20, that becomes like Congress and nothing gets done. 12 to 15 is perfect. Um, you do it in three to five meetings. You can get through all these and that. Um, when we get to the end, we don't make it a yes, no, are you in favor or not, but we measure your level of support for a stormwater utility. And uh, we tend to use, I, I use what, what I call the O meter. There's a meter at one end says, you know, heck no, at the right says heck yeah. And in the middle are various levels of agreement. And we ask people for their initial vote, and then we let somebody on the left and somebody on the right try to convince the rest of the group that they're correct. Then we take another vote and we say, does this, this distribution reflect the group? And everybody goes, yeah, that, that's, that's what we feel. So then you can go back to council and say, this, these are various levels of support that we have. And uh, typically nobody says no, because after you educate them and after they understand the issues, they tend to go, I don't like a fee. I, I don't like, you know, government growing. But we have to do this. It's like saying we don't want police. We, we don't want firemen. We don't want drinking water. Uh, we have to do this, and we're not doing it. I get it, you know. So let's make it fair and, and so on. Then council is free to authorize something. And what you don't go to council and say is, okay, let us set up the fee. That's not the council. Council doesn't have enough info. Uh, they're, they're not comfortable with that. They'll say no. What you ask them to do is something they can say yes to. And what you ask them to do is, can we start the process of establishing this fee and we will come back at the following milestones to report our progress and to receive authorization to keep going? Again, no council worth their councilmanic selves would say no to that because they, they are not risking very much and they can still pull the plug later. And so now you're, you're kind of... Uh, uh, you're kind of eating the eating the the monster in small bites, and we don't really focus on the money, and we don't ask them to vote yes till the very very end when we get a real good idea of public support, we get a real good idea of what it can do, what it can do in the first three months, we get a real good idea of how council will in a sense be protected, and um, we've had really good success with this kind of an approach, kind of in a careful uh, culture of honor sort of based approach. Um, so a, a feasibility study gives you a business plan, even if we don't go forward, Manchester, New Hampshire, we didn't go forward with the utility, 
But the guy said, you know, the business plan we ended up with was very helpful for our stormwater program. I said, well, that's great. <laughs> you need a utility. But anyway, it tests the water before committing, gives political leaders safety, fingerprints on the nap. I said, uses program needs to drive the decision in a fairly simplified way. Um, you can find the pitfalls and so on. Um, yep, getting close. Uh, save time and money and so on. Um, that's why it's a good thing. Okay, full-blown implementation looks like this. We've got a government's track, public. Those are the five areas. This is sort of the don't try this at home. The government's track, it's important to establish early. Uh, sometimes your cuddly little friends stop being cuddly uh, when you start talking about this. So it's important to say how might we work together? What will we do? What won't we do? What's important to you? Then how do we make it legal? Then how do we make future decisions? Who will make them? And what's a roadmap to go forward? Uh, I've done this five or six times and it typically works. Here are the typical concerns in a government's kind thing. Uh, is the money gonna be distributed fairly? Uh, am I gonna lose control of zoning land use? Is Big Brother gonna decide for me? Is this gonna be bureaucracy? Um, who controls the priorities? Are you gonna be responsive? Uh, those are good, honest questions that need good, honest answers. The program track is all about starting with problems and needs and ending with a cost of service analysis, how it will be organized, and what the first three months will look like. The worst thing is to send out a bill and not do anything that first day. The, the day the bill goes out, the person should open the envelope, say, what's this? and then look outside and say, what's that noise? Oh, look, a backhoe solving our flooding problems. So we really wanna do that, uh, follow a logical building block. We've made a compelling case, now we have to execute that compelling case. Um, the other thing is be realistic, make sure that your budget and your promises match each other, otherwise you're not going anywhere. Uh, and also understand that I was drinking from a fire hose uh, from a trickling hose budget wise and the day the bill goes out I'm going to be drinking from a, a, a relative fire hose of revenue I have to know how to handle that revenue efficiently uh, funding track um, basically it's a rate structure analysis and a rate study and cash flow analysis ending with an ordinance and a policy document um, now and in the future there's a there's a million different kinds of things um, and they should follow a, a process of due diligence because when an attorney looks, they're going to look at this more than anything else. A rate structure is made up of uh, these three things, the primary funding method, whether it's impervious or gross and impervious, rate modifiers, flat rate maybe for residential fixed cost per account, other things, they enhance equity and increase simplicity. Secondary funding methods enhance equity and can reduce the rate. Um, the keys to effective rate making, it's got to be explained to your brother-in-law and your seven-year-old. They have to be able to understand it. It can't be too hard. The process has to be pretty flawless. Um, plan for change consistent with the program. Uh, you have to provide for appeals and adjustives, and you have to try to achieve your program objectives through the rate making process. Uh, most of the rates are impervious. Uh, and, and then some are impervious plus gross area and, and various uh, variations on that. Uh, I'm not gonna I'm skip the newer methods because I wanna get to the deal and I know I'm, I'm running a bit out of time here, although I know you give me another three minutes, Darren, right? Buddy old pal. Um, here's the deal. If we get too complex, four bad things happen. I can't explain it. It's hard to develop. It's costly to maintain. And it gives a perception of accuracy that is beyond accuracy, the actual accuracy. Uh, there's way too many factors I can't measure. So we try to keep it very, very simple. We don't have to make it perfect. The law doesn't require that. And we have to match the rate methodology to the community. Uh, this was my uh, driving into Saskatoon to talk about stormwater utility. And I thought, huh, I don't know if Saskatoon restaurant reflects Saskatoon, but I'm going to be careful about environmental reasons to set this up until I understand the, the community. Um, secondary funding methods, there's a whole bunch of them, um, and, and they are designed to take certain costs of the program and charge them to the person who's generating those costs, often development-related costs. Modifiers, modification factors, 
Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of these very, very quickly, credits and uh, flat rate or residential tiers. Sometimes we don't want to charge every residence for what their imperviousness is. It's too expensive. Aunt Minerva builds a new patio and we got to charge her three more cents. So sometimes we just do a flat rate. Sometimes, especially where environmental justice or social justice seems important, we might want to break into big house, small house. And uh, you don't have to measure it to do that. You can use tax database files and regression equations typically to do that. We give people credits on two bases. One, they reduce their impact to the public system through private investment, detention funds, water quality treatment, or they reduce your cost through private expenditure. And that might be a school providing water-based education programs that you yourself think is really important to your community, and so you reimburse them for that. Uh, the courts say those are legally required. Database track, what to bill, how to bill, how to maintain it, how to do customer service. This can be very, very hairy, uh, complicated kind of a thing. Uh, here is uh, the, the headlines in the Indianapolis. Botch bills plague city. Um, this guy got a $14,000 bill for his house and no appeals process and nobody answered the phone. It was a disaster. Um, when we think about billing, we have to calculate the bill amount and bill delivery. How do we do those two things? So what to bill each parcel? Um, your data typically wasn't developed to allocate fees. Um, this is kind of a tongue in cheek with data people, but they're all liars because they all say, yeah, I have impervious data. No, it won't be hard. And then you start getting into it and that's their impervious layer. Uh, this was the impervious layer and you go, you're missing 40% of the imperviousness or yeah, we have parcel boundaries and that's the parcel boundaries or yeah, we've delineated imperviousness. We got high school kids to do it in their GIS class. And you just look and you go, Yes, you did. Um, this is what we got. Um, or, yeah, we've got brand new aerial photography, and you put it together, and it looks like this. And you just go, what was this? This is horrible. Um, you can't digitize it. This is great. This is Philadelphia. Um, how to deliver the bill. There's some key questions about how you do that. Who's going to maintain it long term? Who answers the phone? What does it look like? Um, there's lots of options. Uh, I love it on the current water and wastewater bill because then it looks like a water bill for all sorts of waters. Uh, but it can be billed on the tax bill as well, as long as you can differentiate it from a tax. And, and there's other things as well. Um, it's great to have a really good billing system. This is an example of one uh, so that the customer service people can look at the property and discern if there's any problems with it. And lastly, the public track. Um, we'd like to develop a plan. There's three phases, a long-term phase or early on education phase, then a build up phase three months ahead, and then three months after the you better answer the phone and solve problems phase. Um, you don't want to be making, there's lots of publics and each of them has a different reason to like or not like the utility. So it's important to understand who they are. I have two different rules. Bring me in early, I'm your partner. You bring me in late, I'm your judge. I like to involve the public early and I like a citizens group to get their fingerprints on it because they're tremendously helpful. Um, let's get the first couple spot on right. Um, I have seen states where the first one failed and it pushed everybody back five years um, because no one wanted to be like that. Um, public information plan is a great way to start. Um, and you've all seen those, so I don't need to belabor that. Um, here is the Charlotte Observer Media Don't Delay Drainage Plan fee to ease drain on drains. When it rains, it drains. Um, independence drain collapse points to need for new fee. This was golden. I, I wish we had blown up that street and made it collapse, but uh, nature took care of it for us. Typical 18 months to set one of these up is a fairly comfortable schedule, uh, depending on elections and billing cycles and so on, but you can typically set it up within 18 minutes. And last slide, um, here are the top 10 reasons that they fail. One, we did it convenient and inexpensive. We cut a lot of corners. Two, we didn't make a true compelling case. Three, we didn't understand the process, and so we missed a lot of steps and screwed it up. Four, it wasn't legal, and we went ahead without checking. Five, 
we didn't involve the community early enough or in the right ways and that backlash on us. We couldn't explain our program or funding strategy or our rates. They were too techy or they weren't well developed or they didn't scratch people where they itched. We didn't prepare elected officials for vocal complaints. Elected officials need a script to use to answer questions so that they have arguments that are telling arguments when they get complaints or they cave sometimes. Our revenue and rate structure, we settled on a much lower fee than we needed. Then we couldn't execute a decent program. People complained and our hands were tied. Uh, I've seen two shut down over that. Our database was messed up, we couldn't fix it. And lastly, uh, ill-focused program or inefficient performance didn't meet community expectations. The utility is supposed to be doing this, it's not doing this, and that starts getting in the press and it's too bad. Um, get help, especially for the first one. Um, the total cost of setting one of these up is about one to two months revenue from the utility. Uh, no other investment has that level of return. And with that, um, I'll go back to you, Darren, for Q&A. And Rich, do you have any uh, final closing comments? Uh, I, I uh, responded to a couple um, questions and I added a, uh, a link to a, a video that I think um, illustrates a lot of these concepts and uh, that we prepared, prepared for a client uh, to help support the compelling case to advance to implementation of utility. So hopefully you guys find that helpful. That's great. Thank you. Andy, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for your presentation there. We've, we've had a few uh, questions come into the post and um, uh, everyone else that's still on the line, we, uh, we do have a big group, uh, over 30 people. So uh, um, if you do have some questions, can you post it to the, the group chat? That's probably the, the best way so that we uh, um, can address each of those questions. Andy, the, the first question that came through from Daniel was um, just the, the Harvard change uh, equation, the, the model there. Um, could you maybe go back to that and um, just give a quick rundown? I think he may have missed a, a little bit there. Okay, um, it, I don't need to go back to it, but I'll just explain it. So the Harvard change equation, and, and I can't even find a reference for it. I, I ran into it from a Harvard guy and he called it that. But it's, it's a basic, simple concept that we forget. And that is your ability to bring about change is equal to D times V times P. D is how good of a compelling case can you make? How desperate can you make the current situation in a way that, that and somebody's typing, they ought to, they ought to um, maybe. Sorry, that's me. Their, I'll put that. Okay. Yeah, oh, no, no, you're good. Yeah, you're the boss. Come on, you can do anything you want. Um, so how desperate can we make it? V, how visionary can we make the outcome? How attractive can we make it? And P, how practical can our plan be to get from D to V? Because when somebody says, well, what's our problem? You describe it and they go, wow, that is a problem. What do you want to do about it? You describe it and they go, that'd be great. Then they say, how are you going to do it? And you describe your plan and they go, let's do it. Okay, that's what you need to, to cause something to go forward. Those three things are really important. Thanks, Andy. Um, one of the other questions from Paul was um, um, about um, we're seeing it's struggled to identify ta tangible incentives for low impact design and water sensitive urban design here in Australia. Um, and using imperviousness as the metric for rates seems like a good idea to do that. Um, have you seen with these stormwater utilities evidence of developers or residents decreasing and, and reducing their impervious areas to reduce their stormwater fee? Yeah, and you see Rich's, uh, Rich, do you just want to read your response in case people aren't on chat? I like your response. Yeah, uh, so, so the answer to that is yes. It, it just depends upon whether it's worth the investment. Um, we don't see it quite often with residential properties. The fee's just not high enough. So uh, larger businesses have far more opportunity to do that. Um, so there's a, there's a, a stormwater utility in southern Maine um, <clears throat> that we've worked with, and um, they decided to remove unnecessary pavement, their development uh, activities, the, the nature of the facility operations changed. So they saw a really easy opportunity to reduce their fee. So they reduced their fee from about 50, 58000 to 39000 about a $19,000 reduction. Um, and that was pretty worthwhile, the, the, the level of investment um, to remove the pavement and restore to 
uh, a grass condition or, or uh, plant it. Um, yeah, it was, it was less than a 10 year return. So they felt that that was also, also a good thing to do to help uh, with watershed restoration as well. So some stewardship involved there too. Mm -hmm. One we of do the, yep. Good. One of the problems is that developers don't pay the fee. Owners pay the fee. And unless the owner is wise to the fee during the development process and asks the developer how to reduce the fee and how to reduce some purposes, developers tend not to want to do it because it's a little more risky to do it that way. And so there, there is a bit of an air gap that's sometimes hard to bridge. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Um, there's another question from uh, the group of Fly Tanner that... Uh, where there have been failures in adoption, are there any examples where that program has been able to be saved? Um, or is it the case of your, uh, your airline there that uh, um, you've got one chance and if uh, you stuff it up, you don't get another one? Uh, Rich, you got any right off the top? Otherwise, I've got one or two. Yeah, no. Um, so, uh, Andy, I mean, we both worked in Portland, Maine. Um, yeah. We did a BIM study with them probably eight years ago or, or so. So over an eight year period, we we did uh, a DIM study. They tabled it. They came back. They did a uh, they revisited that um, a few years later. So it usually takes we see it's usually a, a somewhere between a five to six years, sometimes less cycle before there's some um, political appetite to revisit things. It can certainly be less than that, um, but you, you you can definitely get another bite at the apple. Um, I think that's why you know trying to follow a, a, a solid due diligence process to make sure that when you do take your first crack at it, it's your best shot. You know? Yeah, that's that's really true. I'm I'm working with a group of uh, communities up in Grand Valley, Colorado, up in the mountains, and they're at their fourth shot. And I think they just wore each other out with lawsuits, and so finally. Uh, I said, I'm not, I, the opening meeting, I said, unless we have a culture of honor, I'm going to not consult with you past this meeting. But if you have a culture of honor, we can solve the problems. And it was kind of funny. They kind of looked at each other and one of them said, I'm in. And I was like, yes, <laughs> it's like getting kids to kiss and make up. But um, I, I agree with Rich. It takes maybe four to five years if you fail to get another shot at it because uh, people need to rotate out of council, memories need to change, and you need to have a couple floods to trigger things again, and then you're back in the game again. But uh, really trying to do it right so that if it goes down, it goes down because evidence-based decision makers said, this isn't the right time. Not because it got wow. blown up in the media or somebody said something unfortunate or something. Nice. Okay, we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, there's uh, one from Paul again. Can you please elaborate on the zero interest loans you mentioned are provided by some of the authorities? Yes, I was afraid you're going to ask that. Let me try to think about that. Um, it may have been Florida. And this was a number of years ago, probably 10 years ago. Um, some communities will take a, an interfund loan from a wastewater uh, fund balance and then pay it back out of the first couple years of the utility fee to get things going. Um, Rich, do you remember what state was it? Was it North Carolina or South Carolina? Somebody, some state would give grants for people to set up utilities. I'm trying to remember who that was, but it was like seed money, like 10 or 20,000 or $30,000. Yeah, well, in the Northeast United States, uh, Region 1 U.S. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency, they, they've actually been, uh, they've been trying to push and support communities and implement it with implementation. So they've supported a variety of, of grants, which were just, uh, they're flat out uh, cash amount. They're usually pretty limited, so they'll pay for some of the implementation costs. But then they're also, they have been for years now, recently offering 40% um, uh, match loans, which those can be in-kind in service. So you don't have to actually pony up any cash. So um, it, it is happening, it's still happening, and it's, it's, um, it's been happening for a while. Yeah, so. I think a great thing in Australia is, is some of the higher levels of state government begin to offer seed money for people to try this and, and get a couple takers who, who have a good chance of being successful. I would love to see that and, 
you blight tanner people i'm looking at you go find somebody you know who i'm talking to over there <laughs> anyway thanks andy um there's uh a uh, question here from Stephanie Brown. Um, do you know whether anywhere in Australia is starting or exploring this process at the moment? Um, uh, as an outsider, international perspective, uh, do you think there are places in Australia that might have the appetite? Um, it, yes, but I don't want to name names unless they raise their hand during this thing. There, there are, and, and Andrew Allen, you know some as well, um, we thought one wanted to start at a certain location and we actually went to get it started and found out uh, the mayor wanted to start but the senior staff did not and that that was a disaster um but um i i think that there if i had to guess i'd say there are five or six scattered around kind of standing in the door um some of that group from the uh, national conference who joined the Slack group, um, some of those folks were very interested in starting. And I don't know, Andrew, if you want to weigh in uh, with any more on that, or Darren, you probably know too. Um, yeah, look, Andrew, go for it. I was going to say, only to say, look, I think it's a very, um, at least in Victoria, it's, yeah, there is there is there is interest. Um, there's been a lot of changes in terms of state policy and um, that require higher standards in terms of the way stormwater is managed. Um, and sitting alongside that is a question of how you go about you know, sort of implementing. Um, and then where does the revenue and the resource come from? So I think with all of the stuff that's happening around this, it's a, it's a really, um, yeah, it's a really intriguing idea that um, is probably long overdue. Yeah. I know Rich Niles' wife is beginning to pack their attic out for a move to Australia, so he's ready. <laughs> I'm not missing by much, am I there, Rich? <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah, Bly Tanner asked about Blacktown. Anybody from there? Kingsborough Council? Yeah, I don't think we have anyone from Blacktown um, on okay. the line today, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, Ian says that Melbourne Water um, had a redevelopment scheme which gave fee reductions in rainwater tanks. Uh, sorry, if rainwater tanks were installed, but the model failed mainly due to not being able to fix specific drainage issues in the area that the fee was collected. Um, so a bit yeah. like uh, you were talking about, Andy, that uh, um, yeah. taking from one area and giving to another and, and not being relevant to the specific area of collection. Yeah. And um, one of either the, no feasible technical okay. solution. Sorry, uh, I'll just finish with the no, question there. Either no feasible technical solution or not enough money coming in. So uh, um, interesting experience there in Melbourne. Yeah. One of the things that I, I would really like to avoid, and I, I, I know this is popping up, and that is we set up what looks like a pseudo utility it might be privately funded by an HOA group or something to pay for their own infrastructure and it looks like a user fee, but it isn't a user fee and it isn't comprehensive. And so what happens then is you get this, you get an idea that you have a user fee, but because it doesn't pay for a comprehensive program run by a local government, it ends up being a placebo that can keep you from taking the actual medicine. And, and I, I, I'm really worried about that. I know it's popping up maybe around Melbourne and stuff. And uh, while I think it might be a good idea for a private company to fund their own uh, stormwater infrastructure kind of a thing, uh, we just need to be careful what we call it so that people don't mistake it as a fee and go, well, we, we don't want to do that, so I guess we don't want a fee. Uh, that has happened in the states where People set up stormwater utilities. California is notorious for this. Setting up stormwater utilities to only fund stormwater quality because that was the, the thing in their face. And then when they want to raise the rate to actually fund the big part of the program, the maintenance and capital, uh, nobody wants to because, well, you already have a fee and you want to raise it from $1.50 to $8? Are you crazy? You know, I, I don't see anything you're doing with the $1.50 because you're not doing anything they can see you're doing regulatory compliance and so i would just be very very careful about if we're going to do it let's let's do it let's make it a comprehensive fee that can really fix some things on the ground early on 
and really done right. I, I'm about ready to say, I'm going to retire. And if you just pay my living expenses, I'll come and help you just as a friend. <laughs> um, just because I'm just very jealous. I know Rich is too. We've seen what it's done in the States and it's done remarkable things to the stormwater in the States. Just remarkable how uh, prosperous communities are that have a decent fee is how, how well run their stormwater programs are. So anyway, it's a, Next question. Great, great. Andy, um, I might uh, take moderator's uh, liberty here and, and just ask a question myself that um, what would a DIMS study cost? Um, I think I said, uh, you know, eight to $12,000. We'd scope it out, but not much. I mean, it's, it's a half day meeting and some hours of discussion and research ahead of time and uh, an hour to write up the report. Uh, so it's a, it's not very much. Excellent. So in other words, to, um, to get the, the journey started, it, uh, it isn't necessarily a, a significant investment. Um, and uh, I think, as you say, that you've got the um, eject button um, at the end of each of those parts of the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Melbourne Water was the one, and I meant to talk to, um, uh, what's her name from Melbourne Water? But anyway, um, about that parks and drainage charge, I, was, I, I forgot to read up on it, but yeah, I knew they had that. And it was primarily for their major systems, none of the money went to the local government. Well, they built a lot of things in the local communities, but the, the minor collector systems were still kind of overlooked, I think, from that charge. Is anyone in Victoria that can comment more on that? Uh, I know Jamie's made a, a post there, those, for those of you that can't see it, that uh, Melbourne Water do have a parks and drainage charge um, that, uh, um, for, uh, that's charged through the water and sewer bills. Um, but uh, what about local government down there? Is anyone from uh, local government that can help us there? I'll, I'll chime in. Just um, So there is that waterways and the, 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 the charge that Melbourne Water collects. Um, how that's allocated, that's allocated sort of within Melbourne Water using their internal processes. And across the, across, across the sort of the range of water bills you get, um, you receive, there's a fair bit of money that's collected from, you know, sort of communities that, gets allocated by the utilities that that money goes back to. The thing that I liked about um, Andy's presentation, and I've also seen that, um, I think Peter Coombs did it um, also at the, the conference, was actually looking at the total um, revenue that's generated on a per, per area basis, and then starting to equate that to what the level of service is, or you know, sort of what you would expect to see. And aggregating up what council's spending and what Melbourne Water's collecting and spending, and actually looking at it from a whole of systems perspective. Um, and there's another process that's going on behind the scenes in Melbourne that's looking at um, what are the institutional arrangements between Melbourne Water and councils um, in relation to, you know, sort of drainage management um, around sort of where the you know sort of asset ownership and everything um, occurs. And Andy's been. Um, in Melbourne, talking to a, you know, a municipal group about you know, sort of these these sorts of concepts, and I think it's really interesting. Um, if we want to do it properly, we have to acknowledge that local government looks after you know, maybe sixty or seventy percent of the the lineal length of of assets, um, but doesn't have the opportunity um, the way things have been set up to actually um, receive the revenue to manage that properly. Um, and there has to be a holistic conversation about that. That's my view. Yeah, I and Ian and Jamie uh, added some things here and they're jogging my memory. I did have a discussion with the Melbourne Water person about, uh, so often, so for example, in Nashville, the, the Melbourne Water of Nashville took over stormwater and, and added stormwater at the very, very local level to their program, and so they do it nationally. Uh, Louisville Water, like Melbourne Water, took over stormwater, and they said from the bottom of the catch basin down is ours. From the top of the catch basin up belongs to the local government. 
So they split it that way. And so this Melbourne water thing I, I see is a great start. Um, and they offer grants to do projects, but it's still not local collector system management, but it's a, it's a wonderful start. And you could certainly build something like that. Cleveland water does something almost exactly like Melbourne water. They handle the system a hundred acres and bigger and then give grants to all the communities to build things up in their systems. Um, but still the local collection system isn't quite managed because it still isn't quite paid for. Yeah, that's what Ian said, 60 hectares. So about the same kind of thing. Excellent, thanks Andy and Rich. Appreciate your time and, and thanks Andrew Allen for uh, facilitating this um, webinar and, and getting it all together for us. Um, and thank you all for attending. Um, the uh, the webinar has been recorded and uh, um, we'll be talking to Andy about getting the, the slides available on the, the website as soon as we can. Uh, so look up there uh, probably next week and we'll have that yeah, uh, loaded I'll up can, for you. I'll convert that into PDF as soon as I get off her and Andrew, I'll send that to you. Okay. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate your time. And uh, we look forward to doing a few more of these in the near future. Thank you thank for you setting it up, uh, Australia. Thank you. Thank you very much. No thanks, Andy. Thanks, Rich. Bye-bye. Yeah,